lo que es la tercera conferencia de una serie que empezó con Fucho Irache, Yuhani Palasma ayer, hoy con William Curtis y el próximo lunes con Jacob Blair. Eh, seguro que todos conocéis de sobra el trabajo y la obra de William Curtis, pero a breve reseña previa simplemente decir que William Curtis es un importante intelectual, sobre todo historiador, crítico, además de pintor y fotógrafo, que ha sido profesor en la Universidad de Harvard, en la Asociación de Arquitectura en Londres, en Cambridge University, y, pero sobre todo ha sido más conocido, es más conocido para nosotros, o por lo menos para mí, como autor de libros de historia de arquitectura con las que yo me he formado y muchos de nosotros también. ¿no? Quizás el más famoso, Arquitectura Moderna desde 1900, el libro sobre Le Corbusier, Ideas y Formas, o los últimos, Black Krishna Doshi, sobre Nueva Arquitectura para la India, o La Estructura de las Sombras, y por último, la obra completa de Teodoro González de León. Es también conocida su labor como crítico de arquitectura, con los artículos, con artículos en las revistas internacionales como son Architectural Review, Architectural Record, el Croquis o Jornal Líder de Arquitectura. Y últimamente ha iniciado una nueva labor, una nueva faceta como intelectual y como creador, con exposiciones sobre su trabajo como pintor, con la exposición en Círculo Bellas Artes en el 2002 sobre paisajes mentales, o sobre sus fotografías en el Museo Álvaro Alto en el 2007 sobre estructuras de la luz. Ha recibido numerosos premios internacionales, quizás el por destacar solo uno, el Founders Award en la Sociedad de Historiadores Críticos de Arquitectura. Eh, personalmente, <coughs> simplemente re reseñar que para mí la figura de William, aparte de, de todo lo que ha significado en, en, como su labor como historiador y de algún modo como docente para todos nosotros, el, la capacidad, su espíritu libre, su espíritu libre que ha sido y es un cuestionador, cuestiona la arquitectura contemporánea independientemente del lugar o el foro donde se encuentra. ¿no? Y esa capacidad de críticos sin barreras, sin, sin filtros, yo creo que para mí es lo más importante y seguramente lo más relevante para todos nosotros. Muchas gracias por todo y por volver a estar con nosotros. Bueno, igualmente. <risa> gracias. gracias. Bueno. Uh, muchas gracias, Carlos, por la, esta introducción, mi caro eh, Bueno, por cuestión de idioma, <ríe> es posible en conferencia en una aproximación del español con elementos de gallego, uh, catalán y europeo. ¿no? Uh, si no, es probablemente mejor de la utilización de inglés, <laughs> my own language, uh, but uh, uh, I wish to say uh, that uh, it's very uh, nice to come back to this course, which is now in its third investigation, uh, organized by Carlos and his uh, colleagues, which uses in a very intelligent way the extremely dense context of Santiago de Compostela and not just the city but the landscape to encourage a reflection on uh, certain fundamentals of, of architecture and even of landscape. Um, but for me personally, uh, to come back here, uh, I am an old friend <laughs> of Santiago. I remember my first uh, arrival here in 1990 as part of the Congreso on Institutional Architecture uh, when, when we were reflecting on the future of Santiago and especially the notion of uh, micro-urbanismo, you know, small interventions. The building we are in was in process of design at, at that time and in many ways exemplifies the values of that uh, thinking of, of the time. Uh, but there have been many, many other uh, connections, and to be here on this platform 
uh, reminds me of the inauguration of the building in 1995 uh, when I was honored to be the first speaker in this building after Architecto Caesar. Uh, and uh, this, to me, was an extremely touching symbolic event. But my connections with Galicia take many forms, uh, uh, personal and institutional, uh, uh, including the, the link with the De La Sota family, uh, and uh, especially with, of course, the Don Alejandro himself, uh, who, at the end of his life, used to say, please invite William to talk about my architecture, even in Galicia. <laughs> so I feel a sort of uh, strong connection with, with this place, but also with this landscape. Now, I thought, I can come and give many lectures here. I could talk about contemporary architecture. I could talk about the disaster of Eisenman's building, uh, you know, which I've done many times in the press. I could talk about uh, the history of modern architecture uh, and so on. But I thought it would be more interesting and in the spirit of our investigation in this course to make a, a reflection on architectural space, uh, perception of, of, of architectural space, and the, uh, the whole question of how... Uh, we perceive relations in the, in the landscape. And in particular, I want to uh, reflect upon two fundamental elements in the world. <laughs> One is the horizon, which is supplied by nature, uh, but which we recreate in our minds. Uh, and the other is the platform, which is, in fact, a human uh, invention. And the platform is, in many ways, the most fundamental element of, of architecture. Uh, uh, it's the first occupation of space by human activity. It sets up a boundary. <laughs> uh, within that boundary is the human action. Outside is the world of, of nature. And it also has certain almost physiological characteristics because uh, it places us in relation to anything that's horizontal in the, field, in the field of vision, including the horizon. And this magnetic relationship between a platform in the foreground and the horizon, possibly the horizon of the sea or of the landscape, is one of the fundamental preoccupations I have when thinking about a landscape. Now, it so happens that the students have been investigating the Camino, and especially the last 13 kilometers of the Camino. But the whole question of the horizon is fundamental to Santiago and its history. The idea of a place that you're going to, <laughs> uh, a pilgrimage, uh, and more literally, of course, Finisterra, the end of the world, and the beginning of another world, the horizon, with all of the mystery and anticipation which is involved in the very idea of the uh, horizon. The horizon is hope, but the horizon is also a menace and a danger, the unknown. Uh, uh, the horizon is a line, but it's also a plane. It's where the sky uh, meets another element, in this case possibly water. This is a photograph taken actually between La Gomera and El Hierro in the Canary Islands uh, 11 years ago. So this is not so much a lecture, it's more a parable, <laughs> a kind of sermon, a reflection, uh, using analogies and uh, uh, connections and using, to some extent, my own images, whether photographs or drawings. Now, I have to be sure I know which of these things to do. Um, yeah. So, um, the, the horizon. In fact, the world is not horizontal, as we know, it's curved. <laughs> uh, and even the, you know, what we call the horizon is uh, irregular uh, or in some ways bent. Uh, when we put water in a glass, it also 
is curved. But it seems to me that there is an extremely deep inner psychic need to correct curvature <laughs> and to uh, supply horizontality. I don't know the reason for this, uh, uh, but I think there is an inner need of some kind. And many, many architectures in the history of architecture have worked between the ambiguity of perceiving curvature but requiring horizontality, uh, like, for example, the Acropolis, the Styloboats, or the, the Steps, or many, many other uh, monumental architectures using stylobates, platforms, or other elements which are related to the horizontal. So when we think about uh, the horizon in, in uh, nature, we are, in fact, to some extent, talking about a human construct, uh, a projection uh, of some kind. Of course, in great monumental uh, architectural systems, such as those of Latin America, the Maya, this is uh, Uxmal, one of my favorite sites, the platform becomes one of the primary elements of the entire language of, of architecture. Uh, the platform with its subset, which is the step, of course, uh, the levels of steps, cascades, and then the perception of these from different moving positions. A platform can be perceived directly in front or it can be perceived as a perspective, as happens with the palace uh, of the governor at Ushmal, 9th century, where the eye is in fact launched to the horizon by means of the perspective of platforms. But, so why be preoccupied with the platform in Santiago de Compostela? Because the whole place, <laughs> the whole place, the whole city is a series of platforms, ramps, uh, terraces. Uh, the beauty of this city is the way that an agricultural system, a millinery agricultural system, becomes urban, becomes the actual fabric of the city. And if there is one building that celebrates and investigates this phenomenon, it is the building that we are in, <laughs> which is both an artificial topography and an investigation of flotation, of a superstructure. And threading between the two is the promenade architecturale, the movement through space, up, through, and eventually to the roof, which is one more platform, which allows the perspective of the, of the city. So actually, Santiago de Compostela is an entire system of ramps, terraces, platforms, stopping points. And in the case of Caesar, Caesar has abstracted these elements into the space of his own architecture. So the, the elements that I'm talking about are generic in the history of architecture, and in fact almost, you could say, universal, and yet they are quite particularly exemplified in the city in which we are at the moment. The connection of the Acropolis to the horizon, for example, uh, this view uh, taken alongside the Parthenon 35 years ago, uh, projecting to the horizon but pulling it in, reminding one, of course, of the beautiful text in Le Corbusier's Vers une architecture, 1923, where he says of the Parthenon, the thought was singular, but it was projected to the horizon. Uh, the sense of clear, the, the distant and the close being pulled into a dynamic relationship which is one of the key features of Le Corbusier's architecture throughout his life. Or so many other examples of this framing and holding of the horizon. Uh, Chilida, in the uh, case of the comb of the winds in San Sebastian, the entire scheme, along with the platforms by Penchegui, which is an important part of the, the project, uh, about partly the gesture almost of the hand and the horizon, the holding of space, the ambiguity of space uh, between these similar elements 
and the perception of, of the horizon. So among the things that we are involved in is the perception of foreground and background and the ambiguity of distance and of depth. In the case of the comb of the winds, we don't know how big the distant comb is. We are left in a state of suspension. Not only that, there's another feature, which is the foreground is active, the waves, but the further the eye moves out to the horizon, it becomes still, till in fact the horizon itself is completely stable, whereas the foreground is extremely active and extremely uh, dynamic. These relationships of foreground and background, of framing, of the horizontal window and its effect, one of the prime elements of modern architecture, and very present in this building, incidentally. This is a view actually in Peru, but it doesn't matter where it is. But setting up a relationship between a foreground and a background is one of the themes of this talk. In my case, these are rather personal uh, perceptions. Uh, I grew up in this place. <laughs> I grew up facing the North Sea in England. Uh, as a child, was always astonished by the aura of the North Sea. To me, it was a mirror, silver, changing, black lines, seaweed, calligraphy, stillness, and vastness, a feeling of infinity uh, in that space. And then with the abstraction of the breakwaters and of the beach, the sand. This is the same landscape that was admired by Turner. Turner, who lived 200 years before me, <laughs> was very inspired by this particular part of the North Sea. And I think part of the magic of a piece, like, for example, this piece by Richard Long, is, of course, it's a photograph principally. Without the photograph, the work is much less interesting, but is to do with this energizing of foreground and background. Now, my uh, reading of space is something that operates through architecture, it operates through landscape, but it also, in my case, operates through the action of drawing. Drawing, to me, is partly a way of, of capturing space. It's a kind of writing in space. And, you know, this is... I've done many, many, many works since this one. This is ten years ago. Revelation, which is done with uh, graphite and different inks and, and so forth. But it gives a little bit the feeling of what I'm talking about. This is not literally a horizon. This is not literally a landscape even, but it evokes such things. And maybe abstraction has this capacity to refer to a lot of things without affirming any one thing. Of course, I'm interested in the forces in a landscape, the pressures, uh, the weight of light. To me, light is something almost substantial. Uh, light has gravity. Light has emotion, light, totally transforms a, a space. Um, architecture needs light, but light also needs architecture. Because without architecture, light remains amorphous. <laughs> With architecture, it acquires definition and meaning. So these drawings, which I call mental landscapes, or these photographs, which are very related, although I don't deliberately make a photograph like a drawing or a drawing like a photograph, are partly investigating the quality of an outer space, but I think probably through an inner space, a mental space. Or drawings like this, which is not literally a horizon, it's a calligraphy, and yet somehow it speaks about all of the energy which occurs at that point uh, between clouds, rain, uh, the edge of the world, the, uh, the feeling of the horizon as something almost tangible. And I constantly, I must say, in drawings, keep
keep rediscovering horizons. This is sketches a year ago done in Cape Cod uh, in the United States in a, a beautiful creek where the tide was rising and falling visibly in front of my, my eyes. Some of the photographs are about this ambiguity of space. Um, this is one of a series done in the El Tede, in the uh, volcanic uh, center of, uh, of, of, uh, of Tenerife, uh, in which the effects of light and of m the mineralogical qualities of volcanoes, of lava, lead to a kind of uh, vibration uh, which is almost like an ink Chinese ancient painting. Uh, a photograph like this is not just the world outside, I hope it's also somehow the world inside, including the numinous uh, quality of clouds and flotation, the geology, um, the erosion, the different lines in the landscape. One of the themes that the students are investigating is how do you read a landscape? Well, as I was saying to one of the students today, every landscape is a palimpsest of marks, of lines, of traces, of repressions, of things gone, of things recovered, of impositions, uh, and so forth. Um, there is the erosion and force of the landscape through nature, there are the lines which come from rain or from animals moving, from terraces, from fractures, from earthquakes, from the forces that make a landscape. A volcanic landscape is particularly fascinating for me because it's liquid that's become solid. But in the case of the uh, Canary Islands, the clouds are almost solid. <laughs> and the relation between clouds and their liquidity and the solidity which was once liquid of volcanoes is particularly interesting uh, to me as a, a sort of metaphor of the constant recreation of, of the world. These are sketches done actually in La Gomera 10 years ago, uh, investigating the forces in the landscape. Well, cloud forms, uh, this must be unconsciously a homage to a wonderful sketch by Jürgen Utzen <laughs> of uh, clouds floating over a horizon. And uh, among the artists in the 20th century who has most understood the horizontal platform, of course, Utzon must be number one, uh, uh, and maybe Chalida, number two, <laughs> uh, preoccupied somehow with the uh, horizon. But then it's the energy of clouds, and I would say also the energy of calligraphy, because for me, uh, a drawing is in captation. It's a holding of energy in the in the in the space of the of the landscape. Oops. Um, and uh, I try, in a very very sharp, rapid uh, uh, drawing, to hold the energy or spaces and gravity of of a landscape. These drawings are literally responses to something, and yet they're well on the way to abstraction. And they even have the quality of pictograms, I would say. Well, this one here, which is uh, from a notebook done in, on board ship uh, between La Gomera and El Hierro, the weight of clouds, where the vertical axis is the determinant in the drawing, and yet it's all about the flotation of, of, of clouds. So my reading of landscapes relies a lot on direct, uh, I won't call it observation, because it's not just observation, it's actually reaction. Uh, but then there is a process of abstraction and of transformation. Islands are a particularly important part of my inspiration. I grew up on an island, the Isle of Thanet, the eastern southeastern tip of England and is, is, uh, is an island. I've always had the mentality of an island person. And the Isle of Thanet has the amazing possibility of providing a north view to the North Sea, 
an east view to the place where the English Channel meets the, the North Sea, where the sea is very agitated, or south towards France, uh, uh, the English Channel. Any, any, any boy or girl who's grown up next to the sea knows the difference between looking north and looking south. It's a totally different sea, different light, different behavior, different everything. And so I grew up in a place in which you could be on your bicycle going over the highest point, 300 feet above sea level, and see both the North Sea and the English Channel. Uh, and it, it well, I, I suppose, left me with an impression of a kind of infinity all around me. And it's a, a quality I rediscover. Maybe it's one of the reasons I like Galicia. <laughs> because you have at least a corner with the with the horizon. But the other thing is that I grew up on the beach, and a beach which was full of pools of water in which we would look for shrimps, gambas. And there was the sensation of looking through a lens for these small creatures, and then lifting your eyes and seeing a rock and seeing the horizon maybe 20 kilometers away in, ex in, in immediate relation to the surface and transparency of a pool of water. This experience has been recreated my entire life uh, as a kind of ecstasy that's reinvented in, in other landscapes. And here, for example, a sketch is done on the island of Bornholm, which is an island which belongs to Denmark, which is just south of Sweden in the Baltic. Bornholm is a marvelous island. It's small enough that you can always feel the sea. And in the summer, it's the silver Baltic, the light shimmering in, in the Baltic. It's an island which is of its place, but with a sort of universality, because there are circular churches which refer to the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem. It was a, crusade, a crusader island. And as you walk across the fields, and there's been a lot of discussion of walking with the students, because when you walk a landscape, you perceive it as a rhythm. You perceive it close to and far away. You, you have a, a much more intimate relation with the landscape than driving, uh, for example. And there is a place in the northern part of Bornholm which is called the Holy Cliffs, Heiligsklippen. And it's a series of vertical strata of rock uh, which give an amazing effect to the horizon. And in the distance is a very small island called Christiansu. Close to this, there is a Stone Age burial site. But Christiansu was used as a burial site by the Vikings. And on a particular occasion, in the year 2000, I was wandering around Bornholm on my own, and I happened to be there on the midsummer's night. <laughs> and I had a feeling there must be some special relation between Christian So and the sun. I found a little place to stay, and I woke up at six in the morning, and the sun was shining on the opposite wall. I ran down immediately to the cliffs, and there was the sun coming up behind Christian So. And this is one of these sort of, you know, cosmic moments. Anyway, I became very involved in these rocks and the relation they have to the horizon and did three drawings. This one, this one, and this one. <laughs> All about just what happens when you walk up or you walk down. And I could go back, tick, 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 tick. And this to me is magic. <laughs> the tension between the foreground of the rocks and the horizon, and then Christian so. And then what happens? Well, what happens is you go back to your, your studio and your study in France, and you remember things, sensations come back to you. You might be on another island remembering a first island that reminds you of a third island. All these things happen almost at a subconscious level. Uh, 
But in my case, there is a process of abstraction that begins to take place, looking for the tensions in the sea or in the light or in the horizon. Or sometimes the abstraction occurs almost immediately in front of the motif. This is a drawing executed in Porto uh, nine years ago at Foz. If you know, Foz is the point where the river turns and the sea begins. And there's a particular agitation of the sea at that point with the rocks and the seaweed. And this became a kind of hypnosis. And I began to draw. And initially I drew on the, <laughs> you know, the, the, the famous uh, thing of artists drawing on a serviette in a restaurant. Well, I, that, that was the only paper. But then I realized there was a little shop selling envelopes. So I went quickly and got a series of cards and spent half a day in a kind of hypnosis, reacting to the vibration of, of that place. Does that mean that this is a drawing of that place? No. <laughs> it means that that place stimulated some inner magnetism that comes out through calligraphy, through vibration, through who knows what, uh, creates the, the soul of a, of a drawing. So these drawings are about action. They're also about dance. Uh, they're about m movement in, in space, uh, which is something I do all the time. I can't keep still. <laughs> but they're about the feet on the ground, and they're about rhythm. And sometimes they are memories of places I've never been. I have a wonderful uh, book of photographs by Edward S. Curtis, who photographed in 1900, more or less, the last stages of the indigenous cultures of the southwest of the United States, in Walpi, the first, second, and third mesas, uh, and in the pueblos. And among these amazing photographs, there are photographs of the snake dance, the, the figures moving back and forth, and all the figures watching, you know, a theater, and the movement of these figures, and I'm imagining their feet moving on this sand and, and so forth. And so this eurythmy, eurythmic line, is done almost automatically, and yet there's an image, and it's an image of something I never saw but felt, which is the rain dance and the snake dance, a cosmic dance, a dance in a platform, because this is in a way a platform turned up with the footmark, but then also the entire action of, of, of the dance. But if this drawing was referred to as a narrative of dance, I would be really annoyed because that would totally oversimplify it. It is abstraction. And yet, in it, there is a kind of lyrism, to use the French word. Or another example, shadows and writing. I give them titles, but the titles are not the subject. It's just an evocation of calligraphy in space. Sometimes they're reliefs. This is terrain. It's done just with cardboard, carton, and watercolor. But it's a big landscape or it's a very small landscape. I can't say. Oops, sorry. But this is uh, to show you, not me, but to show you how I actually expose these paintings and drawings. This was the Circular de Bellas Artes in Madrid where they were presented on very slender black strings with the loose knots showing, but hanging from wires, the same kind of wires you use in agriculture for vines, for growing vines. I had a sort of trellis of, of steel with these things hanging in front like objects. They're not paintings as such. And they create a space in front of them and uh, around them. So thinking of the world through these paintings and drawings, inevitably I photographed the world through the same filters, but not consciously. If someone asked me, can you give me one photograph that is emblematic for you of Galicia, it would be this one here. <laughs> this was taken at Bayona two years ago uh, in, in, the, in the summer. 
and, well, you know the place, most of you, uh, and yet it's a calligraphy, and it has vitality, movement, but it's extremely still. It's frozen movement. It's a Zen garden. <laughs> you know, the Zen gardens, Ryonji and so on, are cosmic seas of oh, some sort. So through an actual sea, I hope to find a cosmic sea through a photograph. So a photograph to me is an idea, but not a fully conscious idea. If you know too much, you kill it. A photograph has to be a discovery. This has to be, at the same time, instantaneous, almost unreflective, and yet I hope to achieve a certain kind of stillness and monumentality in, in a photograph. Now, let's come back to the theme of platforms. A platform is the first element, I think, of architecture. And of course, in antiquity, the platform is a place of assembly, of ritual. Uh, this is a sketch done uh, at Olympia, <laughs> since we have the Olympic Games. Uh, Olympia, uh, about uh, 15 years ago, the stadium, the tribune, some steps, and the landscape. That's it, finish. And the relationship between that platform and the distant landscape, to me, is magic and is of the essence of ancient Greek architecture. But not just Greek, of course. Platforms as foregrounds and artificial landscapes in relation to real landscape. But not real in just the sense of the actual, but real in a more mythical sense. Monte Alban, one of the many great sites in Mexico, establishes a ritual platform of steps, but it's also a cosmology in which the underworld is important, the clouds are important, and the representation of the state and of its relation to the cosmos is implied in the architecture. And of all the people who deeply understood this intuitively, it would be Utzen. This is a wonderful sketch, of course, by Jürgen Utzen from 1948, more or less, where he was distilling Monte Alban uh, with a text where he talks about the feeling of being on a rock, but with an idea behind it. It's not uh, nature, but it, there's an idea behind it. I mean, Utzen, to me, is <laughs> so clear about what essentially architecture is. Well, it gives you the feeling of a rock, but with an idea behind it. Okay, that's enough, fine. We don't need Deleuze, you know. We, we don't need French theory. We don't need blah, blah, blah. We don't need, uh, you know, we don't need 35 years of nonsense, of theory, no. We need clear thinking and perception. That's what architecture comes from. And maybe real theory, because theory actually has to do with observation in the original uh, meaning of the word uh, in Greek. Utzen's clouds, which are Chinese. <laughs> uh, they are pictograms, this wonderful, wonderful drawing, which of course influences me, but why? Because I always looked at the sea all my life and at clouds, but so did he, he was a sailor. <laughs> and in my case, this distillation goes on at many scales. Now, this is what it is, which is a tiny little drawing, this high, done with ink. I mean, maybe it's a painting, maybe it's a drawing, where clearly the positive and negative uh, are important. You can't say what it is, you can't say what it refers to, and yet it has the feeling of many things. It actually belongs in a series of distillations of my experiences of Monte Alban and my reading of the platforms, including the underworld underneath the platforms. It has to do with shadow and light. Uh, it's called a cosmic landscape. This little drawing, which was done in 1999, was done, uh, well, uh, you know, 15 years after I first went to, to Monte Alban. It was used in publications, uh, when the exhibition took place in, in Madrid, in the Circulo, they discovered at the last minute they had more money. So <laughs> they said, 
oh, would you like us to make a, a banner uh, of one of your drawings? We can put it on the facade of the building in uh, Gran, Gran Via and, uh, uh, and what's it called? Alcala. Oh, yes, that would be nice. How, how big would it be? Eight meters high. Oh, okay. I have a drawing which is eight and a half centimeters high. We can make it eight meters high. So we did. And we hung this drawing <laughs> off of the urban facade in Madrid for six weeks. It was unbelievable. I have this at home. I don't know where to put it. Uh, I'm looking for a bridge in France which I could hang my uh, drawing off. So there's something scale-less about some of these drawings, which is deliberate, in fact. But there is a, a va-et-vient, a coming and going, between abstraction and observation. I mean, this is a travel sketch. This was done, you know, standing in a tropical heat with, you know, damp uh, in uh, Palenque in 1984 or 5, I forget which, in which I was fascinated by ruins. Ruins, to me, are a kind of an anatomy of, of architecture. Uh, I was fascinated by the jungle invading uh, the remnants of, uh, of a human civilization, the interplay between the hard and the soft. Uh, and I wanted to capture it somehow in, in a drawing, which I think it does, actually. So that goes back, but then I come forward and I do an abstraction. But then I go back and I observe, or maybe I photograph. And the dialogue goes on because these are sites that I visit and revisit and revisit. They're my friends, these buildings. These are my deepest, deepest thoughts about architecture that come from the reaction to, such, to places like, like uh, Palenque or Fatipo Sikri or uh, the... the uh, uh, you know, the Shaw Temple at Mahal Bahurum. My understanding of architecture has been enormously expanded through years of wandering around India, Southeast Asia. Uh, it's long, long gone way beyond the, the confines of, of, of Europe. But there are certain elemental situations which repeat themselves, and the stepping of platforms is one of them. It's a uh, a universalizing element in, in, in architecture, the platform. This is a close-up of uh, Palenque, a sketch of, well, nearly 30 years ago, but with all of the enjoyment of the tropical jungle, the you know, cutting of the ruin, uh, and, and trying to understand the language uh, of, the, of the architecture of the Mayas. Of course, platforms then accumulate to become theaters, a photo, photo of Epidauros and another master of platforms, Alvaralto. <laughs> uh, and it's no accident that Utzon, who comes from Alto in so many ways, uh, uh, he learned much of that from, from Alto. And Alto, his sketches of, of, uh, of Delphi, uh, among my favorite architectural drawings. Uh, why? Because he, he captures the essential feeling of a theater as something which is both part of the landscape and a civic institution. There's all the ambiguity of it being an artificial landscape and it being a civic institution. In his mind, it's democratic, essentially. And yet he also captures the feeling of it being an almost closed world, held by, by the, the arms of the theater, and escaping to infinity, this, the infinite space you feel when you're at Delphi, across the, the valley. It's a wonderful drawing that captures all of this information uh, in a few, a few agitated uh, lines. He's, he's, what, he's one, of my, uh, uh, one of my masters, is, is Alto, when it comes to, to drawing ruins. And of course, you know, it comes up in more or less literal forms. Uh, this is Otoniemi, the main lecture hall, which is a, a reconstitution of uh, ancient theater, but it's also a sort of uh, narrative on the origins of architecture from the platform into the theater and then into the modern technological theater of uh, light and uh, uh, mechanization, uh, 
but all of the, the uh, uh, summation of transformations of platforms and stratification. Stratification is one of the key organizing principles of Alto's architecture. And I can't think of a better drawing of a Greek theater than, than this one, which is actually the theater of Dionysius in Athens in 1929, more or less, um, where Alto takes us into the actual organizing anatomy of the stepping and the seats. But we have the feeling of an, an anthropomorphic architecture, a body architecture, and also of a social architecture, the individual body, but also the shared uh, realm of, of the theater. Uh, he's interested in construction, he's interested in acoustics, the, the curvature, and these elements, of course, then transform metamorphose into his architecture to become levels, scoops. Uh, the light scoops are the acoustics of light <laughs> in, in Otiniemi or in the Nordic Museum in, in, uh, in Aalborg or, or so forth. So by reading antiquity, you can release an entire world of potential modernities. There's no contradiction between having a deep sense of history and, uh, and, and creating marvelous modern things. In fact, I'd almost say it's essential to have a deep sense of, of antiquity to create an effective uh, modernity because these are elements which are, in a way, across time. Perhaps that's what Ioanni was telling us uh, in his lecture, too. There are certain things in architecture that don't change very much, actually. Uh, they get reinvented uh, all, all the time, and the platform is one of them. But of course, technology changes, techniques change, structural possibilities change. Uh, when an instrument like the concrete frame comes into architecture, uh, the whole rules of the game uh, go into a new configuration. This is Le Corbusier, 1914, the domino, the genotype of his own architectural system. Cantilevering, the free plan, the free facade, uh, floating elements, a new kind of space, liberation of the plan, etc. In his case, the platform metamorphoses into elements of all levels, the terrain construit, the constructed terrain. It could be the roof terrace at Marseille, which is a great platform. It's the deck of a ship. It's an acropolis. <laughs> uh, it's a modern social space. Uh, it's an arena. It's a crash. This is a photograph taken, oh, 20 something years ago, which is a little bit Hitchcockian, a little bit menacing. These infants playing up there where anything could go wrong. One of those children could climb the parapet, for example. There's a little danger in this picture, which I find really quite interesting. Or transformations through classical rhythm. This is the National Theater by Lasden from the 1960s, what he calls strata. All platforms, but in modern materials. So the platform and its amazing capacity to generate space and to pull the foreground and the background together, and even ignore the middle ground. These are things which I think are really fundamental to architecture, and they come up at many, many different times in, in architecture. This is a wonderful site in Mexico, one of my favorites, Xochicalco, 9th century, the ball court. It's a sketch of 1985, more or less. And what I'm involved in here is looking down on the ball court uh, which, you know, was part of this sacred game uh, with the rings. Uh, but I'm very interested in this, in the uh, perspective of the platform and the relation of that to the horizon in the, in the distance. This is a relationship that is partly uh, perceptual. I mean, you see it and you feel it. But it probably has many realms of symbolic meaning to do with the realm, to do with the construction of the empire or of the establishment of territory in, in a larger sense. The very word territory has to do with earth you know, and establishing relations uh, across uh, the landscape. With the students today, we were looking at the last 13 kilometers of the Camino and the way of articulating different 
punctuations in the landscape. And of course, one of the most exciting moments for the, for the pilgrims or even just people who are doing the walk, who are doing it for fun, is when you first see the Cathedral of Santiago de Compostela. This is an incredible moment of joy, optimism, of, uh, you know. Uh, and this relation of the horizon, anybody who's walked, you know, the campos, or they know what I'm talking about with horizons, and the distance, the feeling of the horizon behind you in the distance, this feeling of, i got to keep going. And then the mental sense that beyond even Santiago is Finisterre and the Atlantic. It's quite an important part of the mythos of the, of the walk, actually, is the horizon. Well, I don't suggest that we put uh, uh, pre-Columbian bull courts uh, all over northern Spain, although that could be quite interesting, actually. Uh, uh, but there are things to learn here about how you make a landscape and how you establish relation between a foreground and a background. Of course, this is a ritual, theatrical space. But we find modern equivalents to that. Uh, the Salk Institute by Louis Kahn is a theater of a kind, a propylea, a gate to infinity, where the height of the platform is established so that you can't see the coastline. There's a, a kilometer of stuff, of landscape, of bracken, of paths, but you don't see it. The platform is high enough that your eye is immediately engaged with the Pacific horizon. With the extremely simple element of the channel of water which comes up, he establishes a relation with the sky so that the entire space of sky and sea is pulled into the space of the court. It's a quite extraordinary effect, achieved with almost nothing, <laughs> just relations. Architecture is about establishing relations between things and disciplining those basic elements of foreground and background. The channel of water also gives the feeling of the world under the platform, the underworld, with the water coming up from, from it. So that the platform reads almost as something floating on shadows uh, or of uh, something over a mystery uh, of a kind. It's concrete, it's travertine, it's geometry. But in the end, it's metaphysics. It's uh, an amazing uh, stratagem of, of space. That's the real subject of this lecture. It's platform and horizon, but it's what happens between them. The voids. Always think of the voids. And then platforms are everywhere, even in very recent architecture. One of my favorite recent projects is almost a non-project. <laughs> it's the, uh, the steps in Zadar, in uh, ex-Yugoslavia, Croatia, uh, which were done by Nikola Basic six or seven years ago, on the quay, the quay side, with this, this lovely stone, uh, with the stepping, with a simple harmonic geometry, and with, of course, a section where the waves come in and force the air, and we have... <laughs> A water organ, uh, a wonderful idea. So here's the most simple kind of architecture, achieved with platforms, levels, and these things, I'm sure, will go on being invented through time. I have found uh, platforms and theatres all through the history of architecture. Uh, we could think of the ghats in India, the so-called ghats, which are these stepped uh, edges to the tanks of water, uh, this is Badami, which is 5th and 6th, 7th, 8th century, uh, with the temples. And then the action in the evening of people washing, washing their clothes, washing themselves, the, 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 pe the peasants, the Indian peasants. It becomes a social space. And it, when I ex exhibit my photographs, this picture here is always put with this one here. <laughs> which some of you recognize, uh, is in Porto. It's the swimming pool at Lesse de Palmera by Alvaro Cesar, uh, nearly 50 years ago now, uh, which is actually all about 
the platform and horizon, although the platform in this case is the surface of the pools, uh, which are related then to the sea itself, and the project goes as far as the mole in the distance, the sea wall, which is three, four kilometers away, and all of these are the boundaries in which the space of the human theater of the beach uh, operates. And uh, I really think of it as a water theater. It's very social. And of course, the part that amuses people is to see that attitude to water, which of course is the attitude of Asian peasants uh, and uh, of uh, a very different attitude towards the body uh, uh, and the practicality of water. And then leisure and you know, nakedness, burning your skin, all these things that seem completely absurd to Indian people. Uh, and of course, uh, you know, the vineyard. This is a photograph which uh, un unconsciously is influenced by Syrah, the Grand, the Grand Jatte, but I didn't know at the time. But that figure who has her back to us is the way into the photograph. We identify with her into the picture of, of, this, of, this, uh, of this thing. So photographs for me are a way of capturing certain things about relations between people in spaces. Uh, all, all human interaction is, the, is theater for me. And I love, one of the things I love about this building is the entrance. When people come up the ramp or the stairs and there's something about the space they don't want to leave. They remain in congregations, movements, uh, thing, with the backdrop of the city. It's a very theatrical entrance into this building. And then you're squeezed in and guided through by the architecture. And Caesar is a master, of course, of this uh, movement through space. These are some of the sketches, the suspension and activity of the ceilings in this building. And then the park on the other side, which is a, a wonderful orchestration of the existing and of the new, of levels, platforms, of taking the terraces but abstracting them into a kind of quiet modern space, of ambiguous perceptions. At one minute you're on an axis and then you discover it's oblique as you keep changing position, rising up, the building itself becoming uh, a limit, um, the first essay I wrote about Caesar in 94 was Un Architectura de Bordes, an architecture of limits, edges, and how true it is of the park uh, behind this building. Incorporating the existing, but using the platform as a foreground to the city. Positives and negatives all the things you know. And finally, a very personal uh, note. Because I write books, I do paintings, uh, I get involved in critical battles, <laughs> fights of all kinds. Uh, I try to do things, uh, engage with our contemporary world. At the same time, I remain rather detached uh, from our contemporary world. And the place to which I retire is this, which is in the southwest of France, uh, on the River Lot, in an extremely beautiful uh, landscape, an ancient landscape of dolmens, grottos, paintings 32,000 years old, <laughs> and a, river la a riverscape. And in this place, my other text is my garden which is always in growth and which is partly a series of courts and patios with a palette of greenery which is very restrained, acanthus, boxwood, fig, evergreens, palms in some cases, with levels, platforms, an existing thing turned into a modern thing. Uh, a foreground and a background pulling in the landscape. These are early, very early sketches, 23 years ago. A terrace, levels, forming an enclave of positive and negative spaces. Wood floating above earth, 
stone in relation to steel, foreground and background holding the landscape with hedges, levels. It's a distillation of years of travels. It's my private myth. Uh, it's a ruin, and yet it's a space. And now, a little anecdote. <laughs> the students have all been saying, oh, yes, the route to Compostela. Yeah, yes, do you know about it? Y well, yes, I do know about it, because I live on it. <laughs> I, I live on the, the road that goes between Le Puy and uh, the Pyrenees, between the Abbey of Conques and Moissac, approximately halfway. Uh, just south of the ruined Abbey of Marciac, you cross the course and you descend into the Valley of the Lot, and the path goes right round the corner of our house. And for years and years and years, we would see the pilgrims a little unsure. Is this the way, is it, you know, some Norwegians or, uh, do, do you speak English? Yeah. Uh, yes, I do, actually. I am English. Oh, thank goodness. I can't speak French. Oh, it's okay. Uh, is this the road to, uh, yes, it is. It's only 1,430 kilometers from here. <laughs> Would you like a croissant? Uh, oh, it's so nice of you. Oh, yeah, okay. So, they go past this corner. Two years ago, this corner fragmented in the frost. The stone broke. So we have a Portuguese uh, mason. I said, what, what can I do? Well, which, uh, monsieur, we just have to put some um, cement and crepe. I said, yeah, it's, it's a bit banal. I said, I know, let's make the imprint of a shell. So we tried, it was awful. You know? He said, why don't you just put the shell? Oh, yes, okay. So there's the shell. <laughs> so now the Norwegians don't even ask. They, they say, ah. We're, we're on the road to Compostela. Uh, voilà. So I finish with the moon. Thank you. Okay. okay. Vamos a la playa. Vamos a Finistera. <laughs> Any questions, answers? Proclamations. Uh, how do I turn this on here? Can we turn the lights, please? Yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> no? Okay, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, sir. See. Fuerte. Ah, sí. Buenas tardes, señor Curtis. Gracias por su conferencia. Yo quería volver al principio de su de su charla en la que nos hablaba de las posibilidades que tenía para contarnos hoy y nos hablaba del desastre del edificio de Eisenman. Entonces, lo que le quería preguntar es qué Pardon, idea... No, lentamente, por favor. Ah, perdón. Sí. Desastre de... Del edificio de Eisenman. Eisenman, sí, claro. Entonces, lo que quería... Sin ambigüedad, sí. Era que nos sugiriera una idea para tornar en éxito ese fracaso o ese sí. desastre y cómo hacerlo actuar en sentido positivo en un entorno que no lo necesita. Sí, bueno, es, evidentemente es una cuestión muy complicada, pero en inglés, creo que la primera cosa es enfrentar la realidad sobre el Eisenman Project. El Eisenman Project es una colossal failure, es una absurdity, es una idea mala. idea. You have to stop completely and totally and have no further political illusions about this project. This project is an absolute and complete disaster economically and culturally. It's going to destroy the cultural life of old Compostela by competition. You have an auditorium here, you have libraries, you have a university, you have all the institutions you need in the old city and the surroundings. What is the idea of competing and using up 
60 million euros a year before anything functions in making this monster operate. So the polit politicians have to stop the illusion and face reality and say, stop, this is an absurdity. And it has to be used for something else. The second thing is, it has to be therefore regarded as an incomplete project, a kind of ruin, a shipwreck, naufrage. That's what it really is, and that's what it has to be. Then the question is, how can it be made to live economically? Well, the model of this is actually a commercial center. It's not a cultural thing. It's not a city. It's absurd to use the word culture or the word city in relation to this. The model of this is a hypermarket, hypermarché, or a cine center with 25 cinemas, often autopista. That's what it really is. So, why not talk to Zara and say, can you use this? No, I'm totally serious. Why not talk to Zara and say, can you use this in your marketing, your presentation, and fashion shows? The other thing is fish. What does the re you have to give something to the real economy of Galicia out of this absurdity. At the moment, it's taking everything out. So how can you put back? Well, perhaps there should be a center of aquatic reflections, fish markets, uh, Japanese fish culture one week, Florida fishermen another week, a world center of fisheries, something intelligent related to the real economy of, of Galicia. The third question, which came from an interesting student investigation, was to take a path right through it with trees. And this made me realize that this could be actually active, as the streets could be markets on Wednesday and Saturday, uh, of products from all around Galicia, vegetables, potatoes, uh, here, there, there. But it could be a, shop, a real shopping center. It could actually be transformed into a kind of street with planting, with trees, hiding the horrible facades, okay? But you have there hectares and hectares of unused roof. The roof has to be put to use. You have to find a use. So you need to plant on the roofs. You need to create platforms. And on the platforms, you would have levels where you can look back and enjoy Compostela. One of the problems with Eisenman's project is it's totally introverted. You can't see anything outside at all. This is crazy, one of the most beautiful views in the world of the silhouette of Compostela. So you need to hide this building under greenery and refashion the roof as platforms and levels so that it can be used. And, and hide, it's a very ugly building. What you do with ugly things is you hide them under beautiful things. This is a very simple proposition. So these are some of my reflections. So it has to be made commercially viable you have to finish all political delusions about completing it. It's a bad idea to complete it. It's an expensive idea. No one can afford it in this time. This is one of the poorest parts of Spain. It's a complete scandal. It's an absurdity. It's the last effect of the Bilbao effect. Gone loco, loquissimo, absurd. Stop. Face reality and say, this is a failure. If you go forward, it's going to be more and more of a failure with more and more a destructive impact on the existing city of Compostela. It's uh, a parasite <laughs> sucking the blood out of the old city. So these are just a few preliminary observations of a light kind. But if you would like some heavy <laughs> artillery, I can do that too, because this is such a scandal, this whole thing. But it amazes me how stupid the politicians are here. Gracias. Oh. <laughs> but, but that's not the subject of my lecture, except it is in a way, because this is... Uh, uh, you have the old city, and then you have this new city, por favor, right? So make it into something positive in relation to the old city. And actually, some of the, the themes here are uh, muy pertinente, because even in the foreground, as you know, in the valley, you have an agricultural landscape. And in a way, that could continue up. Not only that, there could even be ecological issues here to do with water. 
water storage, or, uh, which can then be places of leisure. You know, they, I think people have got to explode this problem and look at it in a completely fresh way. You understand? It's become so neurotic, this problem here. And, and sometimes you need an outsider to say, stop doing that. It's like a psychoanalyst saying, don't you realize you're destroying your life? Don't do it. Don't go and see that awful woman again. Oh, okay, fine. Or don't go and see that awful man. Okay, you're right. But, you know, ha, 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 ha. Come on. Come on. So how do you make something positive? But talk to the real business people around here. Who knows how to make money? Zara knows how to make money. So get them in on the act. It's so obvious. It's a commercial center with the autopista. And then think fish. Think fish. And think international fish. You could have a fantastic center of fisheries, of reflection on marine life, uh, and this would be muy pertinente, more than you know, some idiotic, uh, bad, uh, contemporary art exhibition filtered from Reina Sofia or I don't know where. Come on. Okay. Vale. <laughs> Another question. Let's talk about Greek theaters now. <laughs> yes. Yes, sir. Um, I was actually, uh, my question to you is if you could elaborate on uh, the idea of the mid-ground or why you, um, it seems like you almost purposely kind of left that out. Is it, yes. Is it a clarity kind of thing? Or? Oh, no, no. Well, it's, uh, you're, you're quite right. I'm very interested in compression of space. And uh, in... Uh, in Cézanne's uh, paintings of Mont Saint-Victoire, he constructs the painting in such a way that you have a kind of flattening uh, effect with some things in the foreground and then a kind of blue air in the middle where you can't tell how deep the landscape is. And I've always been fascinated by that in his paintings. Well, 20 years ago, I was driving past Mont Saint-Victoire on an October evening and actually, that's the way it is. <laughs> in, the, in the evening in October, it vibrates. It's an extraordinary uh, effect. But of course, I'm interested in this as a pictorial phenomenon projected out again into real space. Now, in, Jap in Japanese landscape design, as I'm sure you're aware, you have the concept of a borrowed landscape, which means you establish a microcosm, a foreground with sand or other elements and you block by either having this high or with a hedge or a barrier what's here to trap what's in the distance and pull it in by analogy with what's in the foreground. So you have an artificial landscape and the real landscape and you make a kind of vibration between the, the two. Now, Le Corbusier does this all the time. He does it on the roof terrace in Marseille with this little artificial landscape in the foreground. The parapet is kept very high so you have the feeling of the rocks in the mountains, which are actually 15 kilometers away, floating on top of the space in which you are. And if I can say so, you know, modestamente, my garden in France is all about this, because I have blocked out the village, uh, except for the church tower. There are a few objects that you perceive. And then you read the, the cliffs, which are three kilometers away, in relation to the platforms in the foreground. They, they have an incredible kind of tension. It's done with nothing. It's done with earth and a little bit of intelligence. You, don't, you know, architecture is about spaces, actually. And when you move around in, uh, between platforms like this, the, 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 the voids take over, you understand, because everything's a positive-negative. It's like the jelly mold. You have a platform, but then you have a void. And when you move into that, the platforms line up with other things in the distance, there are perspectives, and it pulls them in. So you have a very active landscape, which is at the same time very tranquil. Now, I just happen to like this, but I've observed this in many, many, many uh, architectures throughout history that operate with this. Now, I'm sure they operate with this in relation to a content, a meaning that was often political or, or cosmic, uh, in Palenque, Palenque had lower platforms with water terraces. 
which were used for planting. But the idea of this amazing vision of a cosmic landscape floating on water with the sky is agriculture, but it's a dream. You know, it's a utopia, you know. So these are things which, uh, you know, who can explain deep down why one is so fascinated with a certain thing? I really, in the end, it's, it's a mystery to me why I'm so involved in that, but I am, you know. And I'm sure it goes back a lot to the sea, in my experience of the sea as a child. You know, there's something happened there, looking at that, and this feeling of the North Sea. You can never say how far away it is. It's uh, changing all the time. It's like a mirror, you know. So, but you're quite right, and this is a technique. It's not the only technique. Although I enjoyed it in the garden today, in the Alba... Uh, <coughs> yes. Yeah, how do you Yeah, Paso Yoka does it. The main alley, then you have actually a cross, and then you have the hills. You have a formal garden in the, in the foreground with these hedges, and then you have the silhouettes of the hills. And it's a, a, a magical relationship. You know? But Japanese landscape architecture is very involved with these things, uh, where it's also involved with a paseo, moving, you know, a zigzag movement through things. And that's the lesson of this building, is, is moving through spaces. This is a wonderful building. It's a landscape as well as being a building, this, this thing here. Okay. See. Yes. We. Oui. Yeah. <laughs> Hola, buenas noches. Eh, muy agradecido a la, a la charla que nos has, has facilitado porque emociona, realmente es... es eh, Volver a estos temas es como eh, querer recuperar algo que nosotros, desgraciadamente, creo que en, en Galicia hemos ido perdiendo sistemáticamente. Y voy a dar dos ejemplos muy recientes de, de hace una semana. He estado recientemente en la plaza de Fefiñanes, en Cambados, y hay una inscripción en eh, la plaza de Fefiñanes, tiene, por detrás tiene el pazo, hay una plataforma de piedra impresionante y al lado tiene una iglesia y se lee en, el, en, el, en la plaza en una inscripción que hay dice que esa, esa plaza daba al mar uh -huh. eh, lo que se ve desde esa plaza en este momento pues es una serie de barbaridades urbanísticas en las que ha hecho que ese espacio pues haya perdido muy buena, buena parte de su encanto incluso creo que que de la eh, que, de, que del mundo eh, cómo se vivía eh, en aquel momento ¿no? la relación con el mar desde estas plazas de, los, de, los, eh, de las villas eh, gallegas y otro ejemplo también es en Pontevedra por ejemplo pues en, en la plaza de la, de la iglesia de, de, uh -huh. del siglo XIII-XIV en, en Santa María eh, que por detrás también tenía el, el cementerio y en este momento tenía una relación directa con, con el fondo de la ría y en sí. este momento pues también está absolutamente eh, olvidada y, y, y transgredida por, por toda la edificación que, que se ha puesto alrededor. ¿no? Quizás había que hacer una reflexión también en ese sentido cuando se habla de una ley de costas, como la ley de costas no tiene que ver con una línea limítrofe, sino con todas estas relaciones que se establecen con el interior, con las plataformas, con el horizonte, desde donde se ve y cómo se debe ver, creo que sería tanto más importante defender lo que acabas de exponer, que es la horizontalidad, la plataforma y el, la visión del, de, de, del infinito, más que ceñirse a una línea. ¿no? Eh, bueno, pues es una reflexión simplemente para que bueno, los planes no generales producto, ¿no? lo tengan absolutamente en cuenta en conceptos más sí. que más que quizás líneas, ¿no? Sí, sí, sí. Gracias. Okay, we can tell me now. Sí. Beer, drinks. Bueno. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.